He said, oh yeah, yeah, they weren't too happy either. I wrecked one of the race cars. Being in the car business, everybody has crazy stories of customer interactions gone wrong. And of course, test drives gone badly. Now, I limit my test drives severely because we deal in high-end cars, difficult to drive cars, and I like my insurance policy. Probably don't have nearly the volume of test drive stories that an average dealership would because we hardly do any test drives. But the, the ones that have occurred are their own level of entertainment. So I had a 2004 Mustang GT at one point, and it was supercharged. It had full suspension, the frame bars, and it had uh, probably 10 year old R compound tires. So they were absolutely hard as rocks and incredibly useless. And Mustangs are notorious for spontaneously oversteering into crowds anyway. They're not necessarily particularly easy to drive and certainly not easy to recover from a slide because of the solid rear axle. So I was in Pittsburgh one morning and somebody was coming to look at this supercharged Mustang from Michigan. And so I leave Pittsburgh and my GPS is taking me some really odd route through the city. And I'm going, that's really stupid. I'm on the other side. I'm just gonna jump on the highway. So I head towards the highway, but it keeps trying to reroute me. I'm going, what is going on? And I finally get on the highway and quickly realize that the reason it was trying to reroute me is that every stinking highway was essentially closed because they had this crazy black ice epidemic. Every single overpass, underpass, anything was black ice and there was a wreck at every single one. So once I got on the highway, I couldn't get off and get to the next highway I needed because there was a wreck at every off ramp. So I essentially went around in circles and finally was able to like start to get off at one off ramp that had land underneath it and then drive through the dirt to get onto the on ramp to the highway that I actually needed to get to that there was five wrecks on because that one had air underneath it. I almost wrecked after I got on that one because I went under an underpass that was also black ice and there was a wreck in front of me, but me and the car that were in front of me both managed to kind of skid our way into the shoulder and continue going on and not wreck. So by the skin of my teeth, was able to make it back to, to Cleveland. Now the guy was already upset because I was an hour late for my appointment, but I explained to him exactly what was going on. This is completely out of my control, just like a car on black ice. But my detailer was there, so he was at least able to look at the car while he waited for me. I guess Cleveland wasn't quite as bad, but it was still cold. The roads were cold, a little bit wet, and not the ideal time to test drive any car. Now, my detailer took me aside and said, hey, just so you know, this guy, while he was here waiting for you, he started the car up and he was just dry revving it to redline. And even his son was concerned about it. He goes, dad, I don't know if we should do that. And he goes, no, 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 this is, this is how you have to test a car out. And so he kind of told me this in confidence so I knew what I was dealing with. And he said that the guy doesn't seem to really have respect for the car. I said, okay, fair enough. So the guy says, all right, well, I'd, I'd like to take it for a test drive. <laughs> I'm like, you're kidding, right? Like, I just barely made it back because of all the black ice and you want to test drive a sports car that has, you know, it's riding on rocks. He goes, well, we came all the way from Michigan to see this car. We expect to test drive it. I'm like, well, you probably should have asked before you came. Like nothing was mentioned about a test drive. You know, that, that happens a lot of times. I had a guy that wanted to fly out in the middle of winter with snow and salt on the ground to look at a perfectly restored NCRS 1963 Corvette that was as clean underneath as it was on top. I'm like, yep, sure, you can come see it. And I just got this inkling for some reason that I needed to tell him that he couldn't test drive it, which I didn't think need to be said, but that offended him. And he goes, well, how am I supposed to know if I wanna buy the car if I can't test drive it? And I'm like, why would you think you could drive a restored 63 Corvette on salty roads? By the way, nobody buys a 63 Corvette because they like how it drives. It drives terribly. If you do drive it, you won't wanna buy it. And he didn't come out anyway, so he wasn't a real buyer. But anyway, this guy wants 
to test drive this Mustang. And I'm like, not happening. He proceeds to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a Nürburgring certified race car driver, something like that. And so I just retorted, those are the worst. And he was like, what? I'm like, well, everybody that says they're a race car driver has been to racing school or whatever. Those are the worst people to test drive cars because they think they know something. And so I finally acquiesce and say, listen, I will drive. I'll take you guys for a ride. So they get in the car and he's still kind of perturbed. And he's like, well, how, how the heck do you sell cars if people can't test drive them? Well, not everybody has the same expectations. And we don't test drive any cars in the winter because we don't want to expose them to salt. And people still buy them. So... So I start driving. I was very glad that I didn't let him test drive it because we are not two minutes into the test drive and I ask him about his Nürburgring racing experience and it turns out it's just one of those, you know, one day schools that any tourist can do. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, they weren't too happy either. I wrecked one of the race cars. Great, so glad we had this little chat. So I took him on a little two mile test drive he ended up making me a lowball offer like five days later after he got home and didn't buy the car anyway, which I was perfectly happy with because I feel like he would have been a difficult client for a long time. The next one was not quite so dramatic, but it certainly was off-putting. Uh, a good client of mine brought his friend by and he kind of apologized in advance because he said, you know, this guy's a little off color. And sure enough, he was. He was incredibly crude making all sorts of sexual jokes and innuendos, this and that, and essentially just all about the status, the image, things like that. Um, but he was interested in this heavily modified Porsche 911 Turbo. And again, I make test drive decisions based on my gut, and this guy did not pass my gut check. So I was going to drive the car and he was going to come along for a ride because I felt like he had something to prove. He thought he was the best driver on the planet, and this was not the car to try to prove yourself on. So we are not two minutes into the test drive and he's talking uh, about perverted girl stuff and all that. And he looks at me and he goes, do you think, you think I'll get head in this car? I was just like, please tell me you're asking about from another girl because I'm not really sure what you're asking right now, but I think you're thinking like, okay, what is the chick magnet ability of this car? But, you know, I'm stuck in the car with you. So I was a little bit put off by that. Thankfully, he was not referring to immediately, but sometime in the future by someone of the opposite sex. Now, I'm a car salesman. I've been known to do a lot of things in order to make a deal happen, but everybody's got to draw the line somewhere. Probably the, the most dramatic one I ever had was back when I had a dealership in Vegas. Ten years ago, I decided to expand my enterprise, if you want to call it that, and I opened up what I call the world's first destination dealership in Pahrump, Nevada, outside Las Vegas. And I partnered up with a motorsports country club that had a gorgeous racetrack, clubhouse, garage facilities, everything, and I had a dealership right there at the track so that people could come, they could test drive the car on track if that was a, a suitable thing, and you know maybe buy the car, buy a membership to the racetrack, use it there, trade it back in, and it worked out great because we ended up developing relationships with a lot of the members and buying and selling a lot of race cars that people could actually use there, and I wanted the purchase to be more of uh, a lifestyle uh, decision than just like, I'm going to buy a car and then throw it in my garage. But having a test drive policy on a racetrack can certainly have its drawbacks. And I had a guy come out one time to look at a GT3, which is essentially a street car for the track, the perfect mixed use vehicle. And I should have known right off the bat when he was complaining about the tires being bald and needing to be replaced that he didn't know what he was doing. And these were Michelin Pilot Sport Cups, which brand new have about this much tread on them. So a bald tire on that one is actually ideal tread and you need to replace it when the cords are showing through. But he wanted to test drive the car on the racetrack and I wasn't around, but he went out with my salesman and proceeded to spin the car around in turn two and put it into the dirt. Thankfully, he didn't break anything and actually ended up buying the car of all things. But shortly after that, he had a clutch go bad. 
and he came after me and wanted me to pay for the clutch because he said, well, you should have known about this. And I was like, well, I don't think so. So it went to the local Porsche tech who thankfully I was on very good terms with and that way I could kind of figure out what was really going on. And I started doing a little digging and this was the time that my salesman said, you know, he spun the car around on the racetrack. Like he had no idea what he was doing. I was like, oh, interesting, tell me more. My mechanic had me ask a very key question. He said, when he spun the car around, did he put the clutch in or did it stall out? And my salesman said, no, he, it stalled out and he like went in reverse. So he spun the car around, it went backwards and he did not put the clutch in. My mechanic says, you're off the hook because what happens is, I think when you, when you spin those cars and actually go in reverse, that can cause the crankshaft bolt to vibrate and back out. And so that somehow caused a clutch failure. And he said, you're lucky that the clutch actually absorbed that vibration and the clutch was the only thing that failed because that could have been a very, very bad situation. So I fought it out with him for a long time, but he finally acquiesced that I was not responsible. Um, but that was probably about the time that I said, well, maybe I should be a little more careful about this test drive on the racetrack policy because this could get really, really bad if somebody uh, thinks they're awesome and goes flying off the track because I'm certainly on the hook for it. Homeowner's insurance may just seem like some boring thing that you have to have to get a mortgage, but it can be a surprising way to actually save a lot of money. Policy Genius is your advocate to do that. They shop your policy and your insurance needs amongst all the major carriers and find you the best deal. In fact, every time it renews, Policy Genius does it all over again. They check everybody else, they make sure you're getting the best deal, and if there's a better deal out there, they switch you for free. Policy Genius can also bundle your homeowner's policy with your car insurance policy and save you even more. Policy Genius has saved their combined auto and home insurance customers an average of $1,127 a year. So visit the link in the description below, tell them a little bit about yourself and your property, and they'll tell you if you're getting the best deal. Be sure to thank them for their support of VinWiki.